Mein Name ist Silvan Klaudrath. Ich bin quer durch Deutschland gereist, um mich mit den spannendsten Führungspersönlichkeiten auf einen Kaffee zu treffen. Heute bei Culture Coffee, Ida Tin, die CEO von Clue. Ida, thank you so much for having us. Uh, actually, uh, a little bit of a déjà vu. I had an office near here, so super good food around. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess we're going to go there after after this year. Um, I wanted to ask you. You know, you are a tech founder now, but you also have been in non-tech tech businesses before, such as I think motorcycle tours mm -hmm. or something like this. Um, and you know, what are the what is the pedigree of a tech founder? Is there even a difference <laughs> between a non-tech founder and a tech founder? Mm. Not necessarily. I think a lot of people have the misconception that you have to be a techie to actually start a tech company. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not. I have two brothers who were techies, so mm -hmm. I was definitely inspired growing up. Mm -hmm. But I think essentially you need to have an idea that you're really passionate about mm -hmm. and that you trust there is a market for and have the sort of craziness to, to start one day. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's anything that makes a tech founder really different from an entrepreneur in some other field, mm. necessarily. When you, when you just said the craziness, what is that craziness about? You know, if you want to have financial security, if you want to make sure that you look good socially, mm -hmm. you know, you might fail doing a startup. You might be willing to be like, oh, didn't work out, but you mm -hmm. know, I'll try something else. Mm -hmm. You have to be courageous, I think. Um, Where in many cases it doesn't work out, right? So I understand that the German quota is actually one to 30 companies uh, survives the first two years um, that had funding, <laughs> seed funding. Oh, I'm glad I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a pretty bad quota. Yeah. I mean, then maybe you have to ask yourself whether this, you know, the system and the society is supportive enough to actually help people be successful. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is hard for sure, but mm. not impossible. One out of 30 sounds close to impossible. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a lot of very positive things. So when I found it for the first time, um, I learned so many things. So it was so steep, my learning curve. I could not have paid for an MBA that would have told me as much, right? So right. I mean, even with that perspective, it's still a super good investment into yourself, um, I strongly believe. That's actually a very good way of looking at it. Think of it as a, a way to get funding for your education. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I shouldn't have told the investors that when I first started, but you know, in, the, in mm. hindsight. And yeah. you definitely should make investors more willing to invest in people that have tried and failed, because mm -hmm. then you know, they have, somebody else have already educated them. That's true. Um, and probably you've learned some things that you know not to repeat. So. That's true. So at Culture Coffee, we speak a lot about you know um, leadership culture and, and company culture, and um, it's a habit that I ask people to compare their leadership style to something, something <laughs> like you know music or for example. Lately, we had an interview with uh, with two female CEOs from a marketing agency, TLGG, and I actually asked the question, you know, how would they compare the leadership style with a um, a fashion brand, and mm -hmm. they actually. I feel they got offended by it. They, they told me, you know, it's not a good question. So, and I, I sort of um, tried to check myself afterwards, you know, was there maybe male prejudice at, at work? So would you feel offended by that question? If my leadership style were a fashion brand. Mm -hmm. So I would, my first impulse, like, I'm not well versed in fashion brands. Mm -hmm. I don't care about fashion that much. <laughs> I used to sew all my own clothes. Right. Um, so would I know, I mean, I think it's a difficult question because leadership style is a super complex thing. Like, it is. I mean, leadership is, I mean, what's not leadership, it's really complex. And mm -hmm. even just even knowing and having awareness of what is my leadership style, I think is quite challenging. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you probably want to have different leadership styles, mm -hmm. like you have different wardrobes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we <laughs> Monday <go>. morning, <laughs> you know, it's something. And then, you know, Friday night, something else. So. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Are you asking me the question? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. Okay, so I would say um, maybe Patagonia. Okay. Instead of, a, you know, I think a brand with an attitude, mm -hmm. a brand with a purpose, mm -hmm. a brand with making, you know, they're willing to make some sacrifices mm -hmm. for living their values. Mm -hmm. um, It's also an exclusive brand, you know, it's, they're not selling them cheaply. Mm. <laughs> um, I like that. 
Yeah. Res resonates with you. <laughs> I mean, Thank you. It's a guess. <laughs> okay. Not that and I'm a Patagonia expert. In fact, I don't wear anything Patagonia. But <laughs> well, I mean, it's about your your um, idea of the brand, so that's perfectly mm. fine. Um, we spoke about a founder a little bit earlier, um, but also I'm trying to look for the pedigree of a good leader. So what makes mm. a good leader? Is a good leader, is a founder always a good leader? Is a leader, does they need to mm. be, you know, have, or do they need to have a founding attitude? So mm. can you help distinguish the... That? So um, nobody has to be a good leader, but they need to know if they're not a good leader and then they need to pass leadership on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because of course it's important, you know, if you make bad decisions or you make, you know, create a terrible culture, it's definitely a business problem. Mm -hmm. um, what makes a good leader? Well, I believe a lot in, um, I think fundamentally you first lead yourself. So first you figure out your own sort of emotional journey and ups and downs and managing your own fears and so that you can step into a relation and sort of not... Um, make that get in the way too much. It doesn't mean they can't be afraid, but it means like, hey, I'm afraid about this and that. So how do you think about it? What do we do about it? Or, um, so I think understanding yourself first, I think is the first really fundamental leadership trait. Um, hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, I think there's a big difference between whether you are sort of the visionary leaders person or whether you are the operational day-to-day -day manager, I think those are very different mm. types. Yeah, and sometimes I like the um, analogy that you had earlier that also your leadership style might change like a fashion brand. Um, mm. So maybe you have to change, you know, according to a situation also, mm. the same person and working with the same other person might need different things from each other on different days, right? So yeah. there's this really good book, Situational Leadership, which I, I love, yeah. um, and it speaks a lot about yeah. that. So. Yeah, I think what you say about that, you know, it's not a steady thing, even if you're the same person, like one day, you know, you might more su need support and one day I'm ready to be challenged and the day like, not as much. So, you know, having that and in the end, I guess, a sort of emotional intelligence and relational intelligence. How do we actually make this sort of data transfer mm. happen with as little friction as possible? And, and it's a training. And then again, I also think there's a lot of discipline and things that you can just learn um, or make make it your cadence. For example, something that I learned uh, super early when I work, uh, was working for American companies, they had really good trainings, by the way, and one of the things um, they taught me to always check back which situation I'm getting into. If, for example, I'm making a business review with someone, it doesn't cost me a lot to ask, is today a good day to receive feedback? You know, it's a simple thing like this, because mm. maybe the dog just died and you're exactly. now telling the person, you know, actually last week was not a good week or whatever, right? Exactly. So just check back what situation you're getting into. Yeah. We do that sometimes here where we do check-ins before a meeting, just like one minute, like, mm -hmm. what's going on? It might be exactly, well, my mother got diagnosed again with cancer or I can't find a flat or, you know, or just like, yeah, my weekend was boring and I'm ready to, you know, whatever it might be. And so definitely just helps facilitate a better conversation. Complete change of scenery. So um, in preparation, I read an interview that you gave uh, the guys from Forbes, and they asked about idols that you have. And um, you quoted a Ukrainian ballroom dancer or something like that. You ballet dancer. Ballet dancer, all right, there we go. Um, and you said, he's your idol, but you never explained why. Should we close the loop today? So why? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So. Um, who is he first? He, well, so uh, Sergei um, Polonin. Mm -hmm. I hope I say his last name right. That's fine. <laughs> we, we're going to put it in the tool tips. <laughs> Good. Uh, so he has a lot of um, creative force in him. Like, he just has a very strong sort of um, character. I think traditionally in ballet, people have danced roles. And, you know, they get assigned, like, now this ballet house is going to do this performance and here you go, go train. There is no self-direction as a ballet dancer. It's actually a very sort of uncreative profession in some way. And he was just sort of breaking out of that shell and be like, no, like, dancers need to sort of drive their own careers. And he was the principal dancer in the London Ballet, which is like, you know, the top of where you can get... Um, and he was just like, no, said no to that career and started his own thing. So he has a lot of light. Um, he has a lot of sort of 
power um, and a lot of courage, I think, to, to, to break that really old mold without losing this passion for this art form and, you know, the, the training and, mm. you know, still honoring sort of the craftsmanship, but really giving it a new spin. I can sympathize with that. Actually, it reminds me of a conversation I had with the former CEO of a large retail group. Mm -hmm. um, super cool guy. And he had a big painting in his office um, of Madonna. And, you know, I guess I'm not the first person to ask him, you know, well, what's this picture about? <laughs> like, like, Dude. Um, and the story I really liked, he said, you know, he doesn't know any company or any person who has reinvented himself or herself as often as Madonna. Mm -hmm. I mean, talking of, of having different things in your wardrobe. <laughs> absolutely, definitely the wardrobe. Yeah. But also, I mean, talking about pivots. Uh, you mm. know, if you, if you pivot a company, if you change, and mm. staying relevant for so long is pretty mm. impressive. So mm. I, re I really like the the thought of um, why he had it hanging there. Mm. And somehow still staying true to something that made her recognizable, right? True. Because otherwise you could have changed idol every time she changed, but there was something that felt anchored. Um, yeah.